coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. But we also have a VA and other things where we're, we've noticed that there's a population of veterans, especially in the Army and Marines, where you're coming back and you've been an infantryman and, or an infantrywoman, and now you're unemployed and your skill set isn't necessarily transferable to the commercial marketplace. And so one of the things that we thought about doing was trying to figure out how do we take a commercial operation uh, something that can make money and kind of a charitable um, mission of serving the community. After years of teaching business and entrepreneurship, I found that when guest speakers revealed the hardships and mistakes made throughout their professional and personal lives, it resonated with my students. That's when I thought, why not share these stories so that other entrepreneurs have access to the same insights for education and inspiration? I'm Kazmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. On this episode, we speak with Seth Gibson of Ex Gratia Brewing. Seth is an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and is currently working to establish Ex Gratia Brewing Company, a 501c3 charity brewery. The idea came to him in the carport at a friend's house while they brewed amazing craft beer, and he thought, how can we build a company based on our passion with a social responsibility and benefit? Right off the bat, we go from psychology to theology to pasture to beer. (laughs) Tell us how we make those steps. Growing up, I've always had a passion for people and understanding like how they work and what's going on inside the head and that kind of stuff. So I went into psychology uh, kind of with a passion for kind of industrial psychology, working in the work, in the marketplace, you know, how to make office flows work and people and things like that. And kind of throughout my college career, I knew that there was kind of something else kind of being like inside of me that I felt like I needed to do. And so I went to seminary, went to Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary in Columbia. And the... Uh, master's program there is focused on you know being a pastor in the Lutheran Church and so I spent five years there uh, did a year of uh, emergency chaplaincy in the ER in Wilmington and continue to kind of grow in that place of trying to figure out like what what I was kind of called to do not just my vocation but like with my life uh, what is what is that thing inside of everybody that we want to come, like come out? What do we want to do with our hands and with our life to kind of make the world a better place or kind of provide for our family or whatever it is? Being a pastor, I've uh, worked in uh, a large church and I've worked in a lot of small churches. And I've noticed kind of over the years, uh, I've been in ministry for about eight years or so. And what I've noticed is there or a lot of times people either expect the church to kind of like engage issues or poverty or, or whatever it is, uh, or support charities that uh, do those things. And being a pastor from a small church, we didn't have a lot of extra to give. Um, and it was either gonna be, we could give time and energy as, as volunteers or, or what have you. Uh, we could gather kind of a handful of goods to give, or we could give a small amount of dollars. Um, And that's when the wheels kind of started turning for me because I've always been the type of person that, I don't wanna say it, but it's kind of like I'm a vision person. Like I see what could be. When I look at a space or I look at an organization or I look at um, even a product, like what what could be with that? How could we improve that? How could we um, make that? I mean, there, I've done woodworking at my house. And so I tell my wife or friends that if I see it, if, if I have the right tools, I can build it. Uh, I'm just kind of good with my hands. It's like the, what is it, master of everything, but, yeah. you know, or jack of all trades. Jack of all master trades, of master of none. That's <laughs> it, exactly. Um, sitting there kind of thinking that there's got to be a better way to serve the community because charities do amazing things. They help people in amazing ways. Sometimes it's it's small, like mom and pop kind of uh, thrift stores, and sometimes it's really large organizations that, or nationwide or worldwide doing good things. But no different than the church, those charities right. are organ they're, they're businesses. They're they, businesses. They, they, they're have, they have to pay the rent, they have to keep do record keeping, all, all the stuff that a business has to do are behind that. And, and sometimes 
uh, the public forgets that. Right. Well, and it, but it's also we live in a world that's um, that there's a lot of well, there's a lot of bad, and there's a lot of brokenness, and there's a lot of need. And so I've run into people who are like, I want to give, I just don't know where or how or who or or how do you vet? And the resources are out there, but how do we make it? How do we lower the bar a little bit? How do we help people recognize where needs are, but also how do we? How can we improve and help charities who do great work? One of the things in church, I would, uh, as a pastor, I would say is, if we're not uh, wired or em- if we don't have the employees to help a certain population, then we can support an organization that is, so that our resources are are better served that way. So if you have, um, say, homeless people or people in need coming to the church to pay bills, well, we want to help with that but it's hard to track that and manage that, and especially if you're a small church. So with that, and, and with that mission, you identify a need for the uh, underemployed, the unskilled worker, and say, how can we provide that? Which, for you and I, it was we went to school. Right. In the world we live in, not everyone has that capability. Exactly. In, in doing so, you you fulfill that need for, you, you fulfill that need uh, charitable, and socially, but what do you, where are you going to train and provide skill uh, skill to the labor force? Absolutely. So in Col- I'm from Columbia, and we are a military town. Now, granted, uh, Fort Jackson is is kind of near our neighborhood, and that's where people go to get trained, and then they're kind of kind of spread out to either complete more training or do whatever it is they've been trained to do. Um, it, but we also have a VA and other things where we're, we've noticed that there's a population of veterans, especially in the Army and Marines, where you're coming back and you've been an infantryman and or an infantrywoman, and now you're unemployed and your skill set isn't necessarily transferable to the commercial marketplace. And so one of the things that we thought about doing was trying to figure out how do we take a commercial operation, uh, something that can make money, and kind of a charitable um, mission of serving the community and kind of forcing them together. And that's where we came up with Ex Gratia Brewing Company. Um, the brewing business, the craft beer industry is growing and the margins are really well. Are there, They can be fairly large if you keep your head straight and you manage it wisely. Right. But it gives us an opportunity to um, train people, not just in the commercial side of brewing and producing beer. It also gives us abilities to uh, train folks who are under underemployed, unemployed, uh, people who have disabilities in places like service or food prep or um, sales even. Because if you think about the, the, the operation of a brewery, a, a production brewery, uh, it, and I am not an expert in this. Again, I'm coming from the place of being a pastor. I, I'm a community gatherer. I want to gather people more than just spirituality, but gather community with this kind of idea of working towards something greater. If you look at a our, our, our production brewery, which is what we're working towards, you see that there are kind of different aspects within the brewery that are places that we can train people. So, so bringing that in, you, I, I want to revisit what you said about how you're not experienced in this and you're, you're not trained for this, which I actually greatly disagree with because what your company really does is it is a socially conscious company that is there to provide skills, for, uh, skills and services for a population in need. That you're skilled in, you have that background. You're really not a brewery. That just happens to be yes. what the training program is around. So, so in doing that, you don't need to be a brewmaster level 1000 to do so with that experience. So with that experience and with that mission at hand, you decide, okay, let's open this up. Let's be a brewery. How do we end up at brewery instead of uh, restaurant, product company, anything else? The kind of the genesis of this was was sitting in the carport of uh, my neighbor's house actually and they brew beer and they brew amazing beer and if you look at the kind of the aspect of of the craft industry i, I see that there's two there's probably a, a thousand things about it that make this make sense 
but for me there's two things. The first is kind of the commercial side and the margins are there. If you're if you have good equipment, you're brewing beer at 30 cents a pint and you're selling it in-house between six and, and eight or so dollars a pint. So the margins are phenomenal to be able to create a, a an economic engine that can like cert, like can run itself and use the, the profits, the net profits, to be able to either give it away to charity, turn it into vocational training, or after school programming, or uh, a medical clinic, or what have you. The other side of it, so there's the commercial side, the dollars and cents kind of thing. The other side of it is the craft industry kind of has this community aspect of it that is almost unlike anything else. If you take uh, a millionaire and a construction worker, they may not have anything to talk about, about life, about work, uh, maybe sports, maybe the weather. But if you give them a good beer, a good quality beer, they got something to talk about and it creates that opportunity to connect people. But further than that, you see that all across the country, you see these these pop-ups of people brewing beer in their in their carport or in their garage or in their little like man or she shed or, or, or whatever, and neighbors gather. People just gravitate to that. It's it's not necessarily about the beer. It's about the community. It's about friends and family and um, and just smelling that beer cook and the wait to to wait and see what it's going to taste like and turn out to be. And so for me, I identified kind of the industry is, yeah, I'm kind of passionate about it. I love a great beer, but I also see it as a, a vehicle that can further the cause of helping the community because the community already is hungry for that place to go. And as a, a pastor, one of the things I've recognized is for better or for worse, um, the church used to be that center way back in the 50s and 40s. Um, but now it's lost that place because either of its own doing or bad leadership or all of the myriad of reasons, especially in the light of kind of our climate we're in today. Um, and so seeing that as an opportunity to just gather people and my passion isn't necessarily like be the pastor that's in me and I'm about that and I'll be honest with it all day long but the brewery is about gathering people around a great product with a great cause so with that we have uh, we have a mission we found an opportunity you're not Budweiser you're, you're not selling in every store across uh, America. Where are you at right now? Because you're very early in the execution. You're getting little successes along the day, but we don't talk enough about the stories of the, <laughs> the days we cry at our desk yeah. because yeah. it's very early on and we don't know what to do next. So where are you at? I've been telling people we're taking this from the kind of the, the brain or between the ears to reality. From the, from the page to the street. And so we've been at work at this kind of formally for about a year and two months, so about 14 months now. Uh, I've obviously been thinking about ways to do something for longer than that. Uh, last, this past February, we uh, filed our uh, 501c3 paperwork, Form 1023. Uh, and because our budget is gonna be over $50,000 for three years, we had to file a really large package of documents and print-offs from our website and all that kind of stuff for the IRS to look at our mission, our vision, and how we are going to leverage our commercial operation to meet the threshold for the nonprofit kind of IRS standard. We have our name, we have our logo, and that's the fun part. We get all of that shell together. And really, the first question is, when do you start making beer? We're probably uh, projected, if uh, funding uh, our capital campaign goes well, uh, we have to raise around two to three million dollars to get up off the ground. Um, and 
space and renovation and equipment and all of those things have to fall into place. And not only on top of that, we have to go through a formal process with the federal government to become a licensed brewer. Uh, so we're looking at late 2019. What I've tried to tell people is get excited, stay excited about it. It is a marathon, not a race. Right. You mentioned that it was fun to pick a name. I had a great name because I our, our mission statement is that we are common people brewing uncommonly good beer for the common good. Obviously, I wanted to call this the Common House Brewing Company. There are five trademarks on that. You have to research and research and research to figure out how you can brand and how you can trademark. So that was one of the hardest things to do. It is a marathon, it's a slow process, and so I try to set the winds up to be the little things. But my personality is a little bit entrepreneurial. I'm, as soon as we hit the wind, I'm, I'm already past it. I'm on to the next hill. I, I have to kind of make myself celebrate uh, so that you can kind of realize that you are moving the rock forward. Uh, one of my board members asked us after we got our uh, 501c3 status approved in July, do you feel like you're not, you're not pushing the rock up the hill anymore? And I said, uh, no, I'm still, we're still pushing it. And even once we open and we're in this for a number of years and it's going well, I already know down the line of where I'd like to see us go. It may not end up that direction, but at least I have my eye on the horizon to continue to, and I think that's important in yeah. this, um, is to not lose sight of why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and why I'm doing this is to, is to A, help the community, and help the community with people who, who have served, who have given uh, a lot of their life to, um, to the military or to our government, or even people who have just been down on their luck. And so that doesn't change for me. The, the why, but how we go about doing it, or the texture of it, or the logo, or, or whatever, that stuff, I'm okay with that stuff changing. I want to lead you down a little bit, and, sure. and, and I'll give my opinion if I need to jump in. But I want to ask you who you've identified where you're at right now with your company, who your stakeholders are. Who are the people that you need to make a difference and get their buy-in? So one of the things that um, I try to tell people is, uh, since I'm a kind of a vision person, that I can see what could be, I don't know how to do like the nitty-gritty or the details. And so I'm constantly looking for smarter people. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly looking for people who have been in the industry, uh, the food and beverage industry, the craft beer industry, or even they've run a successful business um, to the point that they're like, they've kind of made a good life for themselves. They've learned things in their years of experience or they've learned things from being in the industry longer than I have. And so our stakeholders, um, whether they're on our board of directors or whether they're on uh, a steering committee, which we have formed uh, recently. Um, these are people that I'm either looking up to for advice or wisdom, because I, I kind of talk about it in capital terms. Capital to me is not always cash. Capital is also about uh, time and energy and wisdom and things like this. Right. Um, being able to come and, and kind of talk to people and network with people who are successful in business or who have learned how not to do things because there's stuff for me to learn. So what is the next stakeholder you need to bring in that helps push that rock up the hill? Right now, we are really looking for people who have a passion for the community and have uh, financial capital and uh, expertise in kind of those areas of architecture or design or brewing uh, or the food industry so that we can uh, have a solid footing when we open day one. So, so, so to be honest, I'm gonna cut you off right now because and, and uh, we, we live in a world uh, that we try to say everything as polite as possible, but, but here's the, the fact matter. We need money. Yeah, we need money. Absolutely. We need money. We want people's time. We want them to help out. But no different than the church, and the churches will give us this same speech. It costs money to Absolutely. move this mission. Absolutely. We need to have our, we need this place to congregate. We need resources to provide our mission or to fulfill our mission. 
Brewing equipment alone, three hundred thousand dollars. Right. So, so my question is, as we bring on new stakeholders, and we're hopefully, hopefully finding donors and participant, we do want people not to just throw money at us. We want them to be a part of our mission and, and, and our belief system. But how do we go about that? Because long term, everything you've told me about what your mission and vision is is all the help that we can give to our members and the under the underemployed, the unskilled laborer. But right now, it, it's hard because that's the pushing the rock up up the hill is right now, that's what we're trying to get to. But there's still quite a bit of ways out there until Absolutely. we can get those resources. So how do we go about that? So so how are you because because getting those stakeholders has nothing to do about making beer. <laughs> that's the fun part. How do we bring them to the table so we get to so we get to the making the beer and servicing our members. If you ask for money, you get advice. If you ask for advice, you can get money. You want people to have buy-in. And so I am constantly pulling on networks of people. People who show interest in what we're doing, people who show interest in the end product or in the end result of serving the, the community and saying, and trying to connect their passion for the community or their passion for craft beer to our mission to, to kind of combine those two things. And so pulling on their network and saying, who else do you know? So building my network, even even in, in being shameless and handing out my business card, being shameless uh, about talking to people in the public or in the grocery store or on the beach about, hey, this is what I'm doing and, and trying to make those connections and for people who you know kind of the light bulb goes off it's kind of trying to get the rope around them and saying well let's talk later let's keep that conversation going um, and if they are people who are uh, have influence in the area or they're connected with the chamber of commerce or whatever it's going it's it's being visible it's showing up to those meetings and those breakfasts and making connections and just kind of as much as I want to go and like look at equipment or go look at properties. We're not there. So as we kind of are coming to a close, let me, I got a couple questions I kind of just want to wrap us up on. And, and these are the, these are the stories we tell in 10 years too. Right. What's happened in your, since you started this, that you just, an example of like, oh God, I shouldn't be doing this. Like, let's just call it a day. And we all have many of those. If you're not careful and you let go of one rung before you grab the other, you can fall a bit. And um, I am currently kind of living in this place of, uh, as a family, we're trying to kind of make ends meet and trying to figure out how we can keep, keep pushing this thing up the hill because we know it's a good thing. And we know that there are people around us who are willing to help us make it happen. But the challenge is, as just as, a, as a, somebody who's starting a business, to make sure you do your legwork of family finances, making sure that you can keep the roof over your, your family's head and food on the table. and Because none of that's in the business plan. No. And that's probably one of the greater pressures. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the other pressure and the other challenges have been, I tell people, every day that I wake up, I learn that I don't know something. Every day that I wake up, I'm, we're either digging deeper in accounting or marketing or strategy or this or that, and I'm learning that, oh, I don't know that. And so having to rewire myself to be hungry to keep learning and saying the the end this is why we're doing this well then that's what i want to end on give me an example of something or a success no matter how small or big that we're, you were saying this is why i'm going to do this again tomorrow it's the small conversations with people who think that there is there's still hope in this world and when they hear the story of what we're trying to do, they may only give like $10, but they're like, I wanna be a part of that. Or the guy who sells beer at the local like company that kind of wholesales beer, they're like, when you're up and running, let us know, we'll, we'll, we'll buy from you. It's those little things, even though they're way down the line, or people who are willing to volunteer in the uh, kind of the tap room, just to be there, so, um, that's that's important. Yeah. So, for, so those of uh, those that are watching or listening to this, how can they find out more and perhaps Absolutely. donate? 
Uh, check, check us out. Uh, we have a website, uh, exgratiabrewing.org. Uh, uh, Ex Gratia is Latin for From Grace. We're also on Facebook, uh, and we are trying to push as hard as we can to fundraise and raise our kind of $2 million so that we can get this thing off the ground. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being here. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash Nexigy Education or visit InfluencingEntrepreneurs.com to catch up on previous episodes with Casimir Ward.